Welcome back to the Capital Mindset Show, everyone. Hope you guys are having a great day. As always, it's really good to be back. And we're going to start today off by discussing a really heavily requested company. I'm going to be doing a lot more requests now, now that I'm kind of a more stable uh, place. So the first stock that we're going to be talking about is Sony Group Corp. So Sony Group was actually requested. I don't know how many times there was actually, I think, a growing joke amongst the community that everyone would just request uh, Sony. So if you went into the uh, stock request uh, page in the Discord, <laughs> it was flooded with Sony. So I, I love the, um, uh, I guess, the camaraderie in order to get this video to happen. So with that being said, we're going to jump right into it and start talking about, first of all, the price action. So if you've been invested in the market for quite some time and you're probably maybe an avid gamer, you remember that back in the olden days, uh, Sony was basically made fun of. Uh, now, I know today that sounds absolutely crazy with the popularity of the PlayStation 5 after the subsequent popularity of the PlayStation 4. But during the PlayStation 3 days, when Sony was really making inroads in gaming consoles, uh, there was still some, not stigma, but I, I felt like the gaming community back then was a lot more kind of a, oh, Sony over there, they're just struggling, right? No one says that today, but back in those days, it was quite interesting. And let me actually show you the price uh, chart for Sony <laughs> back in those days, what I'm talking about. The PlayStation 3 days, which was around the great financial crisis a little bit afterwards. Um, and you can see that had you invested around that time when sentiment was really low among the non-investing community, that was a great opportunity for you. Now, that, that's not saying that that's the metric you wanna look for, but it's just interesting to note. And again, you'd have to be around that time in order to really uh, remember it happening. So uh, that being said, let's, let's kind of get right into what's been happening with Sony as of late. So Sony's gonna be a very difficult business to really get I guess a solid valuation for because it's a conglomerate and conglomerates naturally have the conglomerate discount because they're more difficult to analyze. There's a lot of moving pieces. And while certain aspects of the business might be firing on all cylinders, other parts of the business might be, let's say harming their overall performance in some way. Now you might kind of almost think the sum of the parts valuation uh, here, but I really caution anyone on doing this. Now, it's fair enough to go and do that yourself. You, you can go do some of the parts valuation and, and kind of come together with some sort of value for that business. But when you're looking at some of the parts valuation, uh, I, the market isn't going to agree with you. It's not going to tend to agree with you. What's really going to happen is there are going to be some discount on that sum of the parts. And that's why a lot of businesses elect to do spinoffs to try to realize the value of some businesses. Sony and a couple other businesses, let's talk about, for example, Example. We're not going to talk about it too much in this video, but Samsung in Korea, that's another example or perfect example of a massive conglomerate that has a lot of moving pieces. And some people might say, no, if you look at the whole thing together, it's always undervalued. Well, yes, it's always going to be undervalued. So uh, Sony Group has a crazy amount of businesses. And in fact, I'm going to show or share with you guys here some of these businesses. So you have financial services, which we'll talk about a little bit, but they, they do actually have a credit card. You can get a Sony Bank credit card. And yes, they have a Sony Bank, so a Sony financial arm. Then they have imaging and sensing solutions. So this is actually their software side of things. So you probably already know that they also have the pictures, which, you know, the cameras, I am not filming this video on a Sony camera, but a lot of people do have Sony cameras. So when you take that into consideration, I, I almost count them the same thing, but they're really, they really are different. One's more of like the software SaaS business for again, imaging and et cetera, and also some uh, other cool little tech gadgets that they have, but they, they're kind of related, but not really. And then they have a music arm. So the music arm makes about 11.8%. So music is a, uh, let's say, very high margin business. So once you own the rights to uh, music, uh, you pretty much can generate extensive cash flows from that point on until perpetuity because they keep extending uh, the time duration of which people can own those assets. So uh, music is a very good asset to own. You can see other companies like Warner Brothers Music always trade at a premium as it should just simply because it's very 
once you kind of get going in that business and you have, let's say, a backlog of music that you already own, it's, it's a, the margins are absolutely incredible. So good on them for having that. Then what they're more known for, I guess, by the younger crowd is the gaming network services. So this is where you have your PlayStation 5, the PlayStation 4 for the previous generation, uh, all the video games that they sell on top of that. And keep in mind during the PlayStation 3 days when Sony was trying to capture market or more like resurge the PlayStation brand uh, into its what it is known today, they were actually having a free online service. You didn't have to pay back in those days. And that was, you know, let's say that was just to capture the market, right? Because you had to go to Xbox, and I think Xbox was like $60 a year or something like that back then. I forget what the prices were, but I'm sure they're different now. Um, and nowadays you have uh, Sony also charging that subscription for online gaming. And a lot of people, they buy a lot of these video games for that online aspect so that they can play with their friends. So that's good there. And that's pretty much what all of you guys you know, think of when you think of Sony. Then they also have entertainment technology and services. So in the entertainment, I am pretty certain that that also includes movies. So yes, you've also seen movies out there with Sony. Uh, Sony currently owns for example, the rights to Spider-Man, and they actually have been making the Spider-Man movies in kind of, uh, let's say, partnership with Marvel that is owned by Disney. So Sony, yes, does produce a lot of movies, and you have seen a lot of their movies. So we're going to be talking about the movie, let's say, business, and we're going to be breaking down some of these. But for the most part, you can kind of get a bird's eye view of this business. And again, you, you kind of want to pencil out some kind of valuation uh, for each of these. Now, the one I will say, or more like the two that I'll say is the ones that we want to kind of focus on is game and entertainment. Uh, from a revenue standpoint, they make the lion's share or they make a significant portion. All of them are significant and you should see, uh, let's say we're looking right here, the operating income performance of the game and network services is down. Uh, now we take a look at their other business lines. It's pretty much up across the board. Financial services, which Man, I, I don't really, I don't particularly like that they're involved in that, but you know, some of these businesses in Japan, these massive conglomerates in Korea, they just want to be in everything. But yeah, it's down 130 uh, right there. So it, it's, it's not growing, but it, it's there. I honestly think that it almost should be spun off, but uh, I, I'm much more excited about all the other businesses. I hope that kind of gets across in this video. I, I'm more excited that they're involved in those other businesses, especially being a bank in uh, Japan. Mm, I, I would rather them focus on their bread and butter. But, you know, it's it's there. And we can say, oh, they make they make money from that. OK, so uh, if we really take a look here at the operating income, because, OK, sales went up, but OK, revenue goes up. But what does that mean for us? Right. We can't we can pay our bills, but what's the amount that we can distribute to uh, shareholders? Right. And then uh, before then, we have operating income. So operating income actually is down. It looks like it got cut almost in half uh, from the previous quarter in 2021. Tough comps. I get it but still not in the direction we really want to see. And then we also take a look at the uh, forecasted number. So their forecast in uh, in the July was basically flat-ish, kind of down, but somewhat flat. I'm gonna call that flat. Um, but uh, nothing really that snaps out at me saying, oh, you know, this is bad or this is good. The music segment, this is again where I say, great that they have this, I'm actually excited, or not excited, but it, I am happy that they're involved in this business. Now, this is the business that if it was by itself would probably have a one of the highest multiples assigned to it by the market of the businesses that they do own. And so happy to see here that it is continuing to grow uh, with the operating income also continuing to grow and forecasted also was continuing to grow, but pretty much the highest margin or one of the highest margin businesses that they can be involved in or any business can be involved in. Um, so excited to see that. Okay, that, that's at least doing uh, really well. Most of their their whole business overall is doing really well. I, I don't want to make it sound like they're just a bad company. No, they're doing they're doing fine. Now the picture segment here uh, also similar issue to the gaming segment, which is okay. Sales are up, great. That's that's great. But operating income is down. Okay, 
again, tough comps, et cetera, all that. Now the picture segment, this is gonna really play into that creator economy as that kind of still builds out, which the trends are still continuing in that direction. Uh, we as humans are becoming more socially connected on the internet. Here you are watching a video from some guy. And uh, yeah, that requires a uh, certain investment on my part for picture quality, et cetera, video editing and all that jazz. Um, and then the entertainment technology and services segment, uh, this one also continuing to rise, but also more importantly, we see that operating margins or operating income, my apologies, are also continuing uh, to rise there. Now, we do have to consider the effects of currency on these numbers as an investor. That's actually something I should have mentioned closer towards the beginning of this video, but here I am. When you're investing in a foreign entity, right, foreign entity, so you're an American and you're investing in a Japanese entity, you need to be aware of those effects on you, right, because it can help you or it can harm you. So if the Japanese yen appreciates to the dollar, right, then that, well, it's a little bit more complicated because Sony's so, it's such an international business. So it's not as simple, but let's take a pure play Japanese company. And if you were investing in that pure play Japanese company, you would be more affected in that case to the benefit because the Japanese yen is appreciating to the dollar on your returns. Uh, and if it was the reverse, it would be to your detriment there. But Sony, not really a it is applicable, but not so clear cut and dry, just simply because it's such an international business. Okay, so I almost consider this just a global company, right? There are a few companies out there or many companies out there that if you're in conversation with me about it and we say, oh, it's an American, I say, no, 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 that's not an American business. I know it's based in America or based in the United States and uh, or just let, let's say North America because include Canada and that I would still not consider it all too much as a American business and almost consider it a global business. So one that comes to mind, for example, let's just say um, is uh, Apple or nah, Apple's does so much from North America. So still consider that an American business. Uh, let's take Alphabet. Alphabet's actually a good one. So Alphabet at this point is so uh, globally diversified. Uh, also Procter & Gamble is probably even a better example than that. Uh, Clorox is a good example too. A lot of the actually consumer packaged goods companies, they're really good examples of being global businesses, not so much, you know, pure play American businesses. Um, take, you know, for example, Nestle and Unilever, who are originally European businesses, but I almost consider them global businesses because they do so much business outside of Europe as well. Uh, so anyways, enough of that spiel. So you do want to be, be paying attention to that. And as I'm going through this, I hope it's kind of getting clear to you guys that there's so many different business lines in Sony. And this is the same feeling you should get when you see Samsung. So uh, the financial services segment, here I was, you know, kind of just uh, dogging on it and it actually is improving. So revenue's down, but operating income is up. Um, and so we do see that the, um, they are involved in insurance products as well. So it's, it's, it's a very, I guess, um, involved financial arm in Sony. So they not only do payment card solutions, but they also do insurance. Um, really weird, right? You would not think, uh, oh, I, I play video games with your product and then you are also a bank over here uh, and I can get a credit card and, and I can also uh, you know, do all these other things. I can insure stuff <laughs> with you guys. That, that's kind of crazy. But for the most part, Americans or people outside of Japan don't really interact with those products. And in fact, if you go to their website, well, I have the website here open just for you guys to, to see. It basically gives you benefits for using the card in Japan. And uh, so you see 0.5% cash back. You're not going to impress anyone with that amount of cash back, honestly. Uh, <laughs> what the heck is that? But um, with Sony Bank Wallet inside Japan and then Club S members earn up to 2%. Wow. So, so for some context for my non-American audience, because uh, there's a bunch of you actually, a 2% cash back. Um, and I think in, in Europe, they have comparable to the United States, but 2% cash back is kind of like the standard. So if, if you're giving just 2%, um, you're, you're not really impressing anything or anyone really, because most cards give at least 1.5 to 2% cash back. And then the higher ranked cards is, uh, you know, five or, or greater than that, depending on, on certain categories. So, uh, yeah, that's nothing to scoff at, but it's there, it's something. And by Sony. So Sony is, you know, 
making some money there. Okay, so uh, with that being said, I'm going to take you guys over to have some other discussions about the uh, music growth. So Sony Music Revenue over the years, so I sourced both of these charts from the internet. And it gives us a good illustration of what is going on. The sources are listed uh, down below. So you guys should be able to, to see it there if you guys want to go check it out for yourself. But we see that um, the music segment has been growing nicely since 2008. It is a bit cyclical here and there. But for the most part, it's up and to the right. And again, this is one of their more attractive businesses. So we do want to see this one actually improving. And it is. So, that, so give them that. Uh, now we go over to the movie segment. So the movie segment, it's no secret. And this this is actually uh, lacking 2022. So take my word for it that 2022 was far more than improved than 2021. For the most part, movies are coming back in a real way. And the movie companies, let's talk about the studios, are also realizing the actual benefits of movie theaters. That means you should go buy AMC stock, right? No, no, that's a joke. We have to have jokes, we have to have jokes, so we make this a little bit more fun. But uh, when we see the the movie segment, this is something I, I hope one day Netflix does a lot more of. I call this the recapture event. So what do I mean by the recapture event? Well, Sony, which also owns one of the largest distributors, distributors of anime, which is actually a very important business, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Um, they actually are the moment in time, the recapture event is the moment in time when the business can recuperate a lot of the costs used up to generate that piece of content. Okay, what do I mean by that? Okay, so um, I'm, I spend $100 million or $200 million on a film and I don't put it to the movie theater. I just put it on my streaming service. Okay, well now the value is something I have to kind of estimate over a period of time of how many people I kept on the platform, right? Because that movie was put on there. How many people did I keep on the platform? And that's very difficult to really calculate. But I believe, I'm a very strong believer that the superior business model is actually kind of almost the traditional business model in this segment, which is we spend the 200 million, we put it out onto theaters, right? Hopefully, hopefully we break even. Hopefully we break even. So if we break even, now we've recuperated our costs and we can put it on our streaming platform. And then from there it can, you know, let's say have a lessened effect because it's not as new, but it's still there, okay? And we can host it on our own streaming service and use that as a reason as to why you should subscribe to our streaming service because we have a selection of films that are there that hopefully over that period of time we've recaptured. Now, icing on the cake is we make money on the film. And for the most part, a lot of these uh, studios, the, the very successful ones that we're mentioning, for example, Sony, uh, they make money on most of their movies. And so that part, that recovery and then profit also can help us fuel more and more content, more and more content in that aspect. Shows is a different story, right? Shows there, you can't really have that recapture event. That's not really how that sort of medium works. But in the film medium, yeah, it, it works. And I, and I really think that that's a good strategy. Now, Sony themselves, uh, I did just mention it, that they are one of the largest, if not the largest distributor of anime and, and why that's important. So I myself am not an avid consumer, but there is a huge market for that globally, okay? And they purchased Crunchyroll from Warner Brothers Discovery. And the price actually that they bought it for was about $1.1175 billion, around there, uh, just under $1.2 billion, okay, to be more precise. So under $1.2 billion, and what they get with that is, again, the largest distributor of anime in the world. So now Sony, I think, made a fantastic investment. I almost say, you know, Warner Brothers uh, Discovery should not have done that. I, I almost wish they should have kept that and figured out a way to expand in that market. But that's neither here or there because Netflix realized, and by the way, for full disclosure, I have a decent investment in Netflix. If you have, if you're new to the channel, you guys can go check out the older videos where I released my analysis on Netflix and we bought it at very low prices. Um, and so it's done very well within the portfolio. But Netflix, I think, has that correct vision where they are investing in that category extensively. And you want that. I would want that. So Sony 
uh, is obviously, I guess, more aware of the opportunity than something Warner Bros. Discovery was. But also at the time, Warner Bros. Discovery might have been a little bit more desperate to to get rid of some stuff so that they could pay off that or, or secure themselves with that massive amount of debt. So maybe it's out of desperation. But point being, I think Sony's management did a really good acquisition there. It's just not much to move the needle really. Again, when you're looking at Sony, it's just part of the entertainment side of their business. So from that standpoint, you as an investor might actually start to get really attracted to Sony here, right? You have a lot of solid businesses, really really nothing that's that's terrible. Even though I, I harped on the, uh, the financial side of Sony, it's not really that big of a deal, okay? So I, it's just I was looking for something to really complain about. You, you, this request that you guys gave me, you guys pretty much gave me a, a stalwart within Japan, and we're like, yeah, um, here you go. So, so I can't really find much to, to gripe about with Sony. Um, I also will say that when I took a look, uh, Sony actually has been buying back shares as of lately. Uh, so you are getting some capital return. And, you know, with, with that also being said, you do get... Um, uh, the solid business itself and the uh, dividend, which I, while really small, is it's still there. Okay, so you still get a dividend and a, a growing dividend. So uh, you got that going for you. Uh, the thing with J Japanese companies, and I'll kind of cut to the chase with this, is Japanese companies, the business culture is, is a lot more conservative. You'll notice this with, with a lot of the stocks that you'll analyze from Japan. And you'll see less leverage a lot of times on the balance sheet. And, you know, uh, that, that, that's a good thing, right? In general, that's a good thing. But you also see a tendency not to... Um, let's say, distribute a lot of capital to shareholders, at least more conservatively. You'll find businesses out there that, that do do it a lot in Japan. Um, there's, uh, what's the name of the, uh, Shinokin, I believe, does a lot of uh, good things for shareholders. Uh, not, I'm almost saying that Sony's bad for shareholders. No, that's not true. But you look at, for example, Toyota, Sony, in, within their respective category, they're oftentimes a lot less leveraged than a lot of their peers. You'll find other businesses that are less leveraged than them, but in aggregate, you'd find that tendency, which is good for a lot of people. They like that. All right, so really getting down to the valuation. So kind of going to the valuation aspect, just kind of quickly going through the uh, the better, I guess, parts or components of Sony's business is uh, their leverage. Now, I'm going to give an asterisk here because some of this stuff is actually breaking only because it's coming in in Japanese yen and it's not converting uh, correctly. So just keep that in mind. But I'll walk you through basically what's important to take a look at or what we can uh, uh, really consider here. So taking a look at really the DuPont analysis, looking at the operational side of the business, and I'll move myself here so I'm out of the way. Uh, you're pretty much seeing a story here of a business that has improved uh, quite substantially over the course of this decade. So uh, very much in line with where the share price has actually moved. So go figure, business performance improves, the market rewards that business performance with higher valuation, higher share price, et cetera. So you've been rewarded handsomely as an investor had you invested in Sony back when the world was kind of almost giving up on them or the market was giving up on them and they really turned that business and really ran with it. So the Sony of today is very different from the Sony of back then. Now, the leverage ratios are where it's kind of getting a little bit weird, uh, but I'll just tell you the uh, bird's eye view analysis of the leverage that I took a look at was pretty much a very low leveraged business and you, you know, very much in line with like what that stereotype is of Japanese companies. And, you know, it, it, I, it's not going to go bankrupt anytime soon. Like that's, that's, I'll stand by that within the next couple of years. It's not going anywhere. Sony's still going to be around. Uh, now watch that just like completely not happen. And that, that'll be funny. This video will age beautifully. Okay. If that were to occur. So pretty much getting into that valuation uh, side of things. Uh, cutting to the chase, it's a bit rich right now. However, uh, where things are going and how the market might start to perceive it. This is, again, for my personal investing style. I'm not going to be involving myself in Sony. If I were to involve myself in Sony, because it's pretty much close to that fair valuating of where that higher amount is or where that higher, let's say, uh, estimation on growth. I'm being way too conservative in scenario one through two. So just keep that in mind, like way too conservative. But I, I put it in there. Um, so I, I'd actually flip this around and uh, uh, get into that uh, higher weighting category on scenario four and five. Uh, but 
scenario five, uh, it might be also a bit too conservative because I've been seeing that analysts are projecting a decline here in 2023, followed by a subsequent strong rise in 2024 from a business operational standpoint as Sony gets through all this. But really right now, uh, I'll tell you the opportunity, I, I wasn't watching it, but the opportunity was actually fairly recently. Had we actually done this analysis back in September 23, or September area of 2022, it would have come out nicely and actually saying, hey, this is an opportunity right here to accumulate Sony. Uh, because you could have been a bit, a lot more conservative in your estimations and acquired a solid business. So the, the, the uh, I guess, presumption here is what's the strategy going forward? Well, if I wanted to get involved in Sony here, um, I would probably build out a small position and kind of just watch it. I believe that one of the best attributes, what makes a good investor is patience and just kind of following that business. Don't be so, um, don't feel rushed to get into any business because then more often than not, not always, there might be a time where you do fantastic, but more often than not, that could lead you to making a decision uh, a bit premature and you get involved with the business for the wrong reasons. FOMO is where I'm trying to get at. So um, you, you're gonna have plenty of times, plenty of opportunities over the course of the life cycle of a business to get involved or add additional capital. So um, I gotta say, Sony gives the, I guess, high praise from an operational, from a business standpoint. From a current opportunity standpoint, I'd kind of give it a meh, but it's, it's fairly priced. I would say Sony is fairly priced. You could still do well if they kick it out of the park and all their business lines going forward. I think that virtual reality is a huge opportunity for Sony. They're one of the few companies I think of when I think of you know where virtual reality is going to go, who's really at the forefront of it, there they come to mind. So with that being said, hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you guys want more videos like this, feel free to subscribe. Also feel free to join the club membership and uh, we'll see you guys in there. Just keep in mind, there is a free version. And then if you want to join the Sunday calls, stuff like that, more than welcome to, but there's tons of value in the free version and we always hang out and listen to earnings calls and uh, you can talk to other members and you know, see where things go. All right, with that being said, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one, bye.